This is the Drumwise Meets, and today I'm here with Spike T. Smith. Hi, Spike. Hi, Tom. How are you, mate? first get into drums and when you first started playing what bands or artists inspired you well I got my first drum kit when I was 13 and the way it came about was um, I was listening to a lot of punk records I was a you know a young teenager and uh, actually just a little before I was 13 one night I was at home and my father, as a musician, was watching a program called The Old Grey Whistle Test, which, uh, do you know? Yeah, I do. I, I wasn't around yeah. when it was originally on, but I have No, <laughs> I suppose now there's DVD box sets and yes. the like, but of course this is going back to when it was on. And, and I was young, very young as well. But, but um, anyway, you know, I, I was... I happened to sit down one evening and uh, start watching it with my dad. And, and one of the bands who were my favorite bands at the time was a band called The Damned. Now, around this time, I was collecting a lot of records that I could. But of course, you weren't seeing these bands on telly and, and you certainly couldn't, you know, there was no internet to go and check things out. So to my amazement, as we were watching this program, who should be one of the guests on it but The Damned? And for those who don't know, the, the, the Old Grey Whistle Test is, you know, I suppose it's, it was then um, what Jules Holland is now. You know, it was a program where artists come in and play live or play a couple of songs live. And, you know, there's a number of different bands or artists on each program. And so the Damned were on and they were playing two songs. And uh, I remember because... I'd seen the pictures of the bands on the records, but it never said who played or who did what. So I was quite mesmerized by, you know, like, oh, you know, the singer's the guy that looks like Dracula or, you know, the, the, the ginger head guys, the drummer, the Raskabies. And, and, you know, so that was the first thing that got me. The second thing that got me was that they didn't even get through the second song and Raskabies started, you know, smashing his drum kit up. <laughs> which again, just blew my young mind, you know? Yeah. And I remember that that was the definitive moment. It was like, right, I'm going to be a drummer. <laughs> so that's where it started for me. Oh, cool. And um, speaking about when you, know, when you first started, what was your first drum kit? Well, after watching that, that program and, you know, for, so from then on, I was badgering my parents for a drum kit. And uh, the, the first drum kit I got, I remember it well, was uh, uh, an Ajax, uh, Boozy and Hawks Ajax. And um, I think they're more known for brass instruments than drum kits. But uh, I've heard, you know, people talk about those kits fondly. And, and I've certainly got fond memories of mine. But uh, it came from a gentleman that my uh, father knew that was retiring from drumming. Um, so, you know, that's how I ended up with that kit. And then it was very much set in the era. You know, it still had the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the calfskin heads <laughs> and... Uh, it came with, you know, like the, the, the soft, fluffy bass drum beater and uh, whatnot and the old Zin cymbals. But, uh, yeah, I loved it. Oh, awesome. I, I remember I had an Ajax, uh, Ajax cymbal um, and someone told me, I don't know if this is true, but it, it very much looked like it. It looked like it was one piece of wire that was really like wound, wound round, you know, and it got bigger <laughs> and bigger. And I was told that was how they made them. Um, right. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I remember that symbol very well. Um, and that was an Ajax symbol, was it? Uh, yeah, it, ha it had the stamp on it, yeah. So, may so maybe that's what would have come with the kit, but the, 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 the symbols that I remember with mine were, were Zin. One might have been a super Zin, mm. and the others were, um, I think, just Zin. I, I, I can't quite remember, but uh, I remember that the Hyatt I had with it got destroyed pretty quickly. <laughs> well, and I, um, actually, that leads me on to my next question. Um, do you still have the kit? I don't have the kit, unfortunately. Um, I'd, have, I'd like to get it back. Um, I sold it to a friend, a friend of mine back in the day, to what I what I thought was upgrading 
Um, I don't know if it was upgrading um, retrospectively looking back because it was a Maxwing kit I went to. So I was probably going to a kit of lesser quality, but um, I was I was desperate by then to have two rack toms. Um, I never knew what happened to the kit. I sold it to my friend. I recently asked him what he did and he told me that he loaned it to, you know, a, a bunch of his friends and that it never came back. And that eventually, apparently, they said that something had happened, whether they'd broken it or, you know, completely destroyed it, we'll never know. But uh, he never saw it again after, which was, you know, like a real shame, you know? Maybe they did, uh, maybe they were doing it like a damned performance and they, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the thing was, is, um, yeah, maybe it was that. But if, it, if anybody was going to have been doing that with a kit, it should have been me, really. <laughs> exactly. <but. laughs> I'd still have it, you know, even if it would have been in bits as well. <laughs> And, you know, talking about, um, you know, when you first uh, saw the Dams on TV and influences and so on, I've asked you about your musical influences, but um, if uh, if you had to pick just one, who would be your all-time favourite drummer? Oh, God, it's a very difficult question, that, isn't it? Yes. Um, if I had to give, like, a very, you know, quick, straight answer, I'd have to say Neil Peart. Mm. Um, I mean, I've got so many favourites, and I, 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 you know, I'm interested in so many different genres of drumming that, you know, one drummer just wouldn't cover it all for me. But, but if I look on, you know, the drummer that I've referred to so much in, in, you know, predominantly my line of playing, which for, you know, the, the you know, the one of a better term would be rock drumming, then I, I would say Neil Peart. You know, I mean, I've got lots of favourite rock drummers. Um, as I've got lots of favorite jazz players, lots of different, you know, reggae players, um, you know, so, and so forth. But uh, if I had to put it down to one name, I, I, I'd, I'd put that name down. And, you know, that is meant to be a hard question because I would find that hard to answer myself. It's it's pretty impossible to just give one. It, it almost it? feels, you know, when you say it, you, you almost feel like, oh, is, you know, it's not, is that the right answer? I mean, but, but you know, I've, I'm just coming up with, you know, like using just everything that I think about, you know, who, who have I drawn inspiration from often? Who do I keep coming back to, to listen to? There, there, there are many others as well, but... If we're just going to put it for one, let, let's keep it at that. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. And <laughs> possibly another hard question here. I, I like to give you hard questions, Spike. Um, yep. what's, what's been the highlight of your career so far? Oh, God, you know, they, 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 there's been so many. It, it, you know, that, that that's an ever-changing thing as well. I mean, you know... Um, when I've been asked similar questions before or something similar, it's like, you know, it, it changed all the time. I mean, playing my first gig was a career highlight, you know, um, or, or just a highlight, you know, that was an amazing experience, you know, one I still hold dearly. Um, you know, then it was playing with my own band, playing our first shows outside of North Wales, where I'm from, you know, that was amazing. Then I eventually joined a band called English Dogs, which were, you know, like a name punk band that, you know, were, were touring and an established band. And when I first played for them was, you know, was, was uh, you know, another, another highlight. Of course, playing for The Damned, when, when that came about, that was like a, you know, I suppose that was like a, you know, a, a very special one indeed, you know. Um, but then, you know, when I first went to Mor um, first, sorry, went to America, uh, you know, I played my first shows with, with Morrissey in America. I'd never been to America before. And um, one of the first shows was Coachella, you know, the very first Coachella Festival, in fact. Right. You know, that was, a you know, a special, you know, like an amazing, you know, career moment. So there, there's so many, really. It's, it, it's you know, it's... It, it's difficult to put it down to one. If I said one, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like the drummer question. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, that that almost makes me feel as if that one wasn't quite the career highlight when, when you know, it was. And, and, you know, and sometimes things like, say, like those first shows and gigs you do, you know, that, uh, you know, they're, they're, 
you know, they're mind altering the uh, <laughs> special of course, because, yeah, because you know, they, they're, they're the first times, aren't they? So, mm. you know, like they're there, but uh, you know, there's some of them, yeah, no, that's, that's cool. Like, um, you know, put it down to one, but yeah, you, that's all you've good. Certainly got a few there. It's funny because some some people find both of those questions really easy and others find them really hard. Like I say, who's your favourite drummer? And I, people will just bang. I just know it straight away. Yeah, and, yeah. And same as career highlight. Like, they'll just have it straight away. But others will do exactly what you've said and say, yeah, it's just, I can't put my finger on it because there's so many different things. Yeah, I mean, you you know, I, I, you, you can put something like that down to, to a given day, can't you? You yeah. know, it's like, you know, you can be listening to something and, you know, uh, you know, like I could be in a jazz mood and I'm thinking, and I love loads of jazz players, but you know, I might go through, a, you know, like a, a real Art Blakey, you know, little phase and, you know, where I'm listening to everything I can by him. And when I sit on the kit, you know, what I've listened to from him is inspiring what I play. And then, you know, like a week later, you, you know, I'm listening to Tom Hunting from Exodus, you know? <laughs> And he's inspiring me of Dave Lombardo of, you know, it, it changes, you know, like all the time, doesn't it? I'm, sh I'm sure you find it the same. Yeah, totally. And actually that, that kind of makes me think of another question to ask you, because obviously we both teach drums. Um, yes. And, um, you know, fr from that sort of point of view, in terms of, you know, students, people starting out with drums and stuff, would you say then that it's, um, especially, you know, if you've had a, a career playing, more rock related stuff or punk or you know what whatever and that's the, the thing that you kind of mainly do would you still say that it's really important to listen to drummers from other genres and you know like so jazz reggae as you said do you think that's still really important i think it's you know uh, vital you know that 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 you do that if you want to grow as a musician and a player and um I mean, for me, my, my introduction to that, Tom, was, you know, when, when I was young from about 15, well, when I started about 13, sorry, to when I was about 16, 17, it was pretty much, I was exclusively, pretty much listening to exclusively, you know, punk. And the more intense and the more furious it was, the more I enjoyed it, you know. <laughs> but there'd always been, you know, like... Um, you know this thing with punk and reggae you know they, they they've been into uh, intertwined since the very beginnings and i won't go too much into the histories of that you know that there's plenty all out there and how it happened but basically you know from from the very first punk clubs in london you know they were playing reggae records the punk bands who were playing there you know enjoy the intensity or or, or you know the dark you know, vibes of the dub or whatever, but, you know, bands like The Clash, you know, uh, were soon, you know, playing a little bit of reggae or, or introducing it into their, you know, like punk repertoire, you know, uh, and then the other bands soon followed, you know, uh, The Ruts, Stiff Little Fingers. I mean, if you want to look at a band that really, really used that amalgamation and became super successful with it, The Police, you know, Stuart Copeland, um, I know that, you know, you wouldn't consider them a punk band as such, but they were definitely riding the coattails of it, you know, maybe, maybe more new way. But, you know, they, they you know, um, took that, you know, like a mixture of the, the, the punk or energetic music, if you will, you know, uh, and reggae and, and fused it and came up with their own thing. And, and when I started to listen more to that style of drumming and, and, and really start to try and play it because I found it super difficult you know that everything's the wrong way round technically to what you know to how you 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 build up your repertoire as a rock drummer um but you know I enjoyed the challenge I, I found a local reggae band in North Wales the first reggae band in North Wales and you know so I, I was uh, you know like playing with them and uh, I mean you know in them days you know I I had too much, en well, you need energy for, for any form of music, I think. It's just how you channel your energy. Mm. But I was channeling, in, channeling my energy in a, an inappropriate manner, you know. Uh, I did develop it over the course of time, but I certainly didn't start like that. But once I started this journey of listening to a different form of music, suddenly, you know, the, you know, the, the floodgates were open, you know. Then I was like, oh, you know, 
yeah, I'm interested in this, you know, in, in some jazz fusion, or I'm interested in listening to, you know, like to, to, to a bit of funk music or, you know, or anything. It was, it really was open. Suddenly, you know, I'd, I'd go out and buy a Sky album or, you know, or um, a Hot Chocolate album, you know, or, or like I said, a Billy Cobham album. And, you know, and I really started to enjoy that. And, and it was actually around that time that I first heard Rush. I mean, I'd been introduced to Rush, you know, well, when I was younger, but whether I wasn't ready for, you know, for, for the uh, intelligence and, uh, you know, that intensity of that level of playing, I don't know, but I didn't get it. But later on, you know, when I was listening to, I'm more open to different forms of music, you know, it, 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 it you know, it hit me profoundly, you know, and so I've enjoyed that you know, more than anything about playing and, and you know, it, and I've enjoyed that in, you know, like, you know, like in my playing career. So, you know, when, when I, you know, at the moment I'm currently playing in a death metal band. Well, you know, that's a completely different thing to when you're playing for Morrissey. Mm, yeah. You know, a completely different thing. And then, you know, one of my favorite bands, you know, that were, you know, like the legends now is Bad Brains, you know, that, that you know, an American hardcore uh, punk band that were four Rastafarians. So, you know, they played reggae amazingly, you know, and, and they were a massive influence, for, you know, on me. And I did a tour with the singer in 2019, uh, you know, so, and now he just pretty much plays exclusive reggae, you know. So I've loved, you know, like, the challenges of, of being faced with different musical styles and yeah you know i i strongly encourage it you know in my teaching and and um you know and i'm sure you do as well i think it's vital you know it's important and not only that it's actually exciting <laughs> yeah totally yeah not being like closed-minded and just focusing on one thing absolutely from career highlights to um kind of the opposite direction here um have you ever had anything go wrong on stage, whether it be equipment fails or brain fails, um, that you can tell us about? Yeah, yeah, I, re I can remember the, the same thing happening to me twice uh, over, you know, in two different periods that feel like my most embarrassing. The first time it happened, I remember, was in a hometown gig. Um, I'm from Hollyhead in North Wales, and... Uh, we were playing, you know, like a local gig. This was in my first band, Alternative Attack. And, uh, you know, we've been going a while. And, you know, by then we were quite a developed, tight little trio. But um, somewhere in, in the set, and I think it was like a, the third, second or third song in, in my excitement, in the break in the drums, I, I jumped up, you know, to kind of, to come down to make a hit on, you know, either the snare and Thomas, you know, a bang style thing. But as I jumped up, I had one of those, it was actually the same stool that I had, that I'd got with that Ajax drum kit. <laughs> so it was one of those flimsy old, you know, like stools where, where the top just, you know, you just sit it on, you know, there's no, nothing to keep it on. And as I jumped up, the back of my foot caught the, the, the top of the stool, which knocked it off. So of course, you know, there's just the spike. Uh, you know, and I'm in mid air, and it's funny how you know these things. We've all got our experience of it, where sort of time seems to slow down. You know, <laughs> and you, you know, I was in mid air. I could see the top of this, you know, the, the the stool going off in a direction, but not the base. You know, the base didn't fall over; it was still, you know, still there. Um, and I, and so as I was coming down. I just had to grab onto my floor tom, I thought, to steady myself. But as I did, my floor tom just buckled, you know, I, I fell over, you know, probably knocked a couple of the drums and a cymbal over, you know. <laughs> and uh, there was no way that I was getting away with it. The whole audience had spotted it. And it was, you know, like, a, there was like one of those kind of laughter, cheers, and, and, and you know, jives. And, hey! Yo! <laughs> You know, that, that, that was embarrassing enough, but a number of years later, and not that many when I look back retrospectively, but probably about six years later, I was playing in Belgium and the same thing happened again. 
uh, and it was the same. And I remember it was in Ghent in Belgium, and and again, you know, the, you know, exactly the same same. Re the, the response wasn't quite the same because you know, the, I guess the place was. Oh, I can't remember, maybe more densely packed or maybe people, that were, it was more of a drunk audience or they hadn't noticed so much, you know, it, the gig was later at night. But I still felt the same. It, it just still felt like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> was it the same drum still? It was, I think. If I cast my mind back, it was the same drum still, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it, it was a long time before I eventually decided to invest in like a, a very good quality stool. I did have stools after that, but they were always just flimsy makeshift, you know, last thing that I wanted to spend money on, which is, you know, foolish, you know, but it's just how it was at the time. So for you, when you first get a gig with a new artist, how do you learn the material? So, you know, for example, do you just like listen to the album on Spotify or whatever, or do you listen to it and transcribe it? Or does someone uh, say, here you go, Spike, here's the entire set written out in drum music in this folder for you. Just read all these dots and learn it like that, please. Yeah, well, that never happens with it, you know, with it, with the bands that I tend to play for not not getting all the music nicely transcribed and given to you. I mean, th that would be very, very useful. Um, it, it really depends, you know, who and what it is and, and the amount of time. I mean, I will tend to work to a system and I and I use a bit of it all. I will transcribe it if I feel that you know, there, there is a bit that isn't coming quickly, you know, or it's not coming quick enough. Um, and I'll always, you know, you know, use a basic roadmap to, to you know, to, to, to work the songs out. Um, I never transcribe, you know, like a whole song. I, I, I'm not efficient enough at that to do that. You know, then my time would be better spent to do it another way. But I use it definitely, you know, I, I certainly use it if, there's patterns within it that I'm just, for whatever reason, you know, each time I go into it, I, I find after a handful of times, you know, I'm, I'm playing it incorrectly or I'm, I'm just not getting it, then I'll transcribe that part out. But I don't really have a need to transcribe, you know, everything out because for the most part, the stuff I'm doing just isn't, you know, that complex, you know. It, you know, I do play some complex music. Um, but really, you know, the, the, the main concerns with a lot of the music that I do is the pace of it, you know. So it, it's about being able to, to, to keep the pace going, to, to be able to make the changes efficiently and quickly. Um, and to be, you know, and to be on top of it with a plan, you know. So I, I, I have like my system that, that, that works for me and, and, I, and I, I work it like that. So I use a bit of it all. Sometimes I won't write anything down. You know, it, it, the music will just come to me. In fact, sometimes it's often the case of, you know, the, the more complex it is, the, the, the less I need it because, you know, it, it the, the, the piecing of the jigsaw puzzle seems to sort of work for me in, 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 in helping me to learn it, you know. But it's when there's kind of odd arrangements or, um, you know, for instance, with a lot of like the older tunes that I played with a lot of those older bands, that, you know, they don't stick to, to, to the more regimented routines. And, you know, so that can be sometimes, you know, quite a curveball, you know. But for instance, you know, I stood in for Sham 69 for Robin a couple of years ago and that all came about super quickly. And I mean, you know, of course, he's sending me live footage. I knew the records. I'll always try and work off more recent live footage if it's an older band because, you know, because these things change so much and, you know, the old recordings have got fade out endings and their tempos change and, you know, and sometimes the arrangement of the songs change. So I try and use, you know, like more up to date versions, but like with something like that, you know, to try and learn, you know, the 20 or however many songs there was in the set 25 or whatever quickly, you know, I was making a lot of notes, but I didn't really need to transcribe it. You know, it's like, you know, that there's a lot of repetition there, but it's knowing the repetitions, you know, so yeah. Cool. 
So it all helps. It's good to be able to read, I think, no matter what you're doing. I mean, it's, you know, you know, the thing is, is that I, I, don't, I suppose I'd find it more beneficial if somebody actually, you know, give you, you know, like had transcribed and said, there it is. It's like, wow, great, you know, <laughs> rather than you having to write the manual yourself. You know? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, so on to a couple of curveball questions for you here. Um, the first one of those is, what are your hobbies away from drums? Well, I mean, uh, I like, um, I like, you know, being outdoors. I like walking. I like, you know, cycling. Um, going to, you know, go, going to quieter places. I mean, you know what it's like when you're, you, you, you're playing music, you're around a lot of volume and noise, you know, and, and I love that. And, uh, and, you know, especially with the music I do, you know, it, it, it's not just yeah, kind of, you know, the, the volume, it's the intensity of, of the, the playing and the listening that goes with it as well. So, yeah, I like that. I like socializing, um, you know, I, I like, I like, you know, going out for a drink. Obviously, we can't do that at the moment. Um, I like investigating new places when I'm on tour. You know, one of my favorite things that I like to do when, wherever I am is, you know, on the day or after sound check before the gig, I always like to really go for a, you know, like a, a good stroll around and investigate the area, even if I'm only there for the evening, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's what I like to do. I like to do a little bit of reading, uh, you know. Just anything like that, really. Spending time with my family. Simple things. I like going out for a drive sometimes. Driving the car is nice. Yeah. You know? Especially at the moment. I like investigating new places. I seem to just really, you know, like that. I don't tire of travelling on tour like, you know, some people do where they moan about it's just two hours of playing at night or, you know, or not even that. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the time is hanging about. It's like, well, you know, that's not it to me. You know? <laughs> it's like... You know, as soon as I'm, you know, done with the venue or whatever responsibilities with when I turn up in a, a town or city, it's like, right, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering off what time we're playing. I'll be back an hour before, you know. Yeah. Good stuff. And I enjoy that, Tom. Mm, yeah. You know, That's nice. I like it. You know, you, you go to somewhere like Berlin and wherever you are, you just have a walk around, you see things, you know, and it's like, obviously, if I've got more time, you know, I'll I'll put a bit of investigation into it and, and, and you know, plan out a couple of things I want to do. But but I, I won't let the fact that I haven't got the time to do something like that stop me from, you know, trying to get something out of the time, you know. And I enjoy that then when I get to the, you know, back to the venue, I'm, you know, I'm always pretty enthused, you know, yeah. rather than sitting about in the dressing room or sitting on a bus or even in a hotel room, you know. Now, um, my second curveball question, which for, for many people that watch these is the most important question. Um, so, what's your favorite biscuit? <laughs> oh, God, I think I've heard this question. I'm still actually thinking about it now. Um, I'm, I'm almost into, you know, uh, feeling that you that's what yours <laughs> oh don't ask me that i don't know i'm not prepared <laughs> yeah, no. well i mean you know there's so many i mean you know i should have put down one of my hobbies is eating sweets <laughs> so oh you know i've got a sweet tooth so you know whatever yeah oh god you know biscuits biscuits i mean you know it's a bit like the favorite drummer thing you know sometimes i'm in the mood for a, a chocolate digestive it nearly always got a you know chocolate or something's got to be part of it you know yeah. chocolate or uh jammy dodgers uh you know chocolate hobnobs uh um you know the the the, the, the little nice biscuits yes are they uh, nice or are they nice though like, yeah, custard creams. Yes. Yeah. yeah, is it nice or is it nice? I don't know. <laughs> I know they taste nice. <laughs> I know all of these, Tom, but this is the critical part. They've all got to be dunkable. Right. So that's right. That was the next part of the question then. So that it's got to be a, it's got to be yeah. a dunkable biscuit. So a jammy it, so you mentioned the jammy dodgers. Does that mean a jammy dodger is dunkable then? Oh, definitely for me. 
Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and I think I think I heard I mean, it might have been Darby, you know, Darby Todd or yeah. Pat. Gabby, one of them mentioned Garibaldi's, and uh, that used to be an old favourite of mine. I haven't seen them for ages, but when I heard it mentioned, I thought, yeah, I've got to, I've got to dig out, you know, some Garibaldi's in my local shop if they have them, you know. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I, I uh, tried the other day, uh, for the first time, I think, a custard cream dunked in tea, and you know what? That was a game changer. It was yeah, yeah, so much better. I've always, you know, like uh, yeah, like I mean, all of those, all those biscuits I mentioned. Yeah, jammy dodger. I mean, something like a jammy dodger to me is too dry if you don't dunk it. Right. Okay. You know, I don't think, say, for instance, if you know, I, I went to just grab a, you know, a biscuit or something like you do, just as a little snack. If I don't, if I you know, didn't have a cup of tea, I, would, I wouldn't think to, to eat a jammy dodger, you know, I, I'd probably eat something more like a, a club biscuit or something like that, you know? Okay. Yeah, because if we're talking about clubs, like so a, a, a Twix or a Kit Kat, is that a biscuit or is it a chocolate bar, you know? So... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, oh God, yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the one thing, even if I, I wouldn't know, you know, what category to put it in, I definitely know that for me personally, they're, they're not dunkable. No. So I love Twix, but I would never think of dunking it, you know. No. Although... Uh, and what's the other one you mentioned? Uh, a Kit Kat. <laughs> yeah, I've never dunk a Kit Kat. Well, see, I, well, I didn't think... Well, I don't know why I'm thinking about it. You know, they're, they're, they're all made of roughly the same kind of, you know, uh, components, are they? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and that's another thing, you know, like chocolate and milk, you know, they, that's, that's a great combination. But I've never tried that. <laughs> One to try. There you go, see? It's all about inspiration. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> And from biscuits uh, to my my final question, my sort of my serious question to, to round things off here, um, if you could give just one bit of advice to people starting out learning the drums, what would that advice be? Well, I mean, I think the, the most important thing is to, is to enjoy your time playing it, so that you feel you know, so that the commitment comes naturally. Um, I think that what can be an issue, you know, where, where for young drummers where they first start is, is not understanding about a, a good practice routine, and and maybe practice routine is, is 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 the wrong kind of words, but you know because it should just be about sitting down, playing, and having fun, and, and that should be encouragement in itself, you know. Um, I've recently been using, you know, like the analogies how how you know like. Uh, not just kids, but anybody get, you know, obsessed by, by, by their games, you know, and, 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 you know, and playing the games. But, you know, that I always think that the, the encouragement is, as, as, you know, like people, you know, end up getting wrapped up in the games because they're getting through, the, you know, the, 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 they're getting through the levels and then they get, oh, you know, at first they can't even get through level one and, you know, but then they eventually get in it and then they, 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 you know, they're stoked, they get to level two and then, you know, they battle along with it. And I feel it's the same with playing the musical instrument, but, you know, it shouldn't feel like a chore. You, you should be enjoying it, you know. So that's the thing that I, I would encourage with, 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 with youngsters who, who are getting into playing it, especially if they do play games, because, you know, in this day and age, they probably do. It's like, well, you know, Try and see the similarities and when you're sitting down of what you're trying to achieve. Firstly, you want to be enjoying what you're doing, but but then you know, you know, it's all about results, you know. And um, so, you know, if you can marry the two up, then you you want the results, but you don't want to just be playing for results, you know, you you want them to come through, you know, through the playing, which hopefully you're enjoying, you're enjoying the challenge. Sometimes it'll be a little bit frustrating and you won't get it, but you keep at it, you know, and, and you keep, you know, like sort of chiseling the way and, 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 you know, it comes together. So, you know, that, that's, that's what I try and encourage people when, you know, they come to me for lessons. Um, I suppose the most important thing is just to try and do it regular and often, even for small bouts, you know. So Spike, thank you so much for spending your time with us here at Drumwise today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. 
I've really enjoyed it, Tom. Thank you very much for having me.